Hello everybody. Um, I'm going to upload again a quick video here just to make sure that we get off on the right foot for week three. You guys are all doing awesome in the class, so keep up the good work. Um, I apologize, I'm a little under the weather. Somehow it's 80 degrees out and I got sick. But uh, just so you know, uh, everybody's doing really well. Definitely, definitely stay up to date on these assignments though because uh, this is only a six week class and there's not a whole lot of room to play catch up. So again, thank you guys for the effort. Just a little bit of constructive feedback. Um, on week one's discussions, those should all be graded, should be back to you. Um, I know we're all adults, we're all busy, but definitely give a little bit of effort on these. Um, these discussion posts take the place of our classroom discussions. Obviously, we're not in a classroom, but it's really an opportunity for you to show, I guess, basically me and your classmates that you get the material, that you understand this stuff. So again, here, we don't try to beat you up too much with assignments. We don't try to overwork you, even though this is a six week course and we'll be, uh, we'll be working at a, at a decent pace. Um, but on these discussion posts, that's what tells me that you're learning something or that you understand what we're teaching. Um, because it's one thing to just spit out, uh, you know, the uh, exact definitions of something because we can look them up and read them. We can all do that. Um, but the idea, the true understanding of some of these topics and these ideas are what we're looking for in that discussion post. So this week we will have discussion post number two. Um, and keep that in mind. You know, I really want you to explore the topics. I don't give you a minimum. I don't give you a maximum. Um, but I just want to know that you get the material. So in, in uh, week three here, we have discussion post and quiz number two. So these will both have to do with chapter four and five material, uh, which are this week's required readings. We're going to try to cover two chapters. Um, and I am going to just go ahead and jump right into a couple of quick things here on chapter four that will hopefully, again, uh, clear up some things and, and help understand uh, or help your understanding of the material. So again, in chapter four here, we are going to be uh, talking about the environmental roots of crime, right? So we're talking about really community and situational factors. And as we get into that, we'll look at families, friends, schools. Uh, these are important, important topics when you're talking about uh, causes of crime or roots of crime. Because if you remember back to our crime triangle, the whole point of that silly triangle is because we're trying to simplify you as your work as a crime uh, prevention expert to be able to attack one or even two of those components of the crime triangle. And if you're able to do that, if you're able to do that successfully, then there won't be a crime. So this is all based off of your understanding of really what it is to go after. And as criminal justice experts, it's great to know that uh, you can sometimes be in a position to provide extra patrols or, uh, you know, help out, do some extra checks or help out with an after school activity. But the truth is, this is where policing and, and you know, even the study of criminal justice goes so much deeper, especially today, uh, because we're going to really, really delve way down to the causes of crime or the roots of crime and see what we can do to affect that. Um, it's kind of like narcotics work. We go after a, sometimes we'll, we'll bust a user on the streets. We'll, we'll get somebody that's got, you know, a felony five little piece of crack or heroin. That's not the crime of the century. But what that does is it tells us as police officers and really anybody in society would have the common question, well, where the heck did you get this? Right? So it's kind of, where's the root? But when you start asking questions deeper and deeper, like, okay, you got it from Johnny dope dealer, which we all know, you know, he's sold dope his whole life. And, you know, we've arrested him 10 times, but then you go and you get a search warrant for Johnny dope dealer's house. And you see that he's got an ounce of heroin. Now, that's a decent amount of heroin. But the next question would be, well, where did you get this? So, I mean, you guys are all young, young men and women. 
So I'm I'm sure you'll know some of the uh, street jargon, but we call it where's the plug, right? We call it who's who's the person who's providing these mass quantities to the dealers. So you're not selling, you know, the plug is not selling to a, to a user directly. They're selling, you know, mass quantities to a dealer to then be broken down and, and mixed and sold again. So <clears throat> the idea is we kind of climb that chain, right? We start with somebody that gets caught with a piece of crack. Then we go up to the crack dealer. Then we go up to the supplier. Then we go up to the wholesaler, right? And that's, you know, you start getting into narcotics, uh, yeah, cartel type stuff, or, you know, we're going over to Chicago, we're going over to Philadelphia, wherever. Um, now, as we look at how does this relate to crime prevention, right? Well, when we look at things like this, we start to, if you ask those same kind of questions, hey, why are there kids fighting every day? Now, I can go and bust a fight of a bunch of high school kids at, at a local park or in a local behind an abandoned building. And I can say, well, why are these kids going over here and fighting every day? And maybe that we have a gang problem. Why do we have a gang problem? You start to trace that up the chain and you get into uh, chapter four here where we start to think about community and situational factors. So the really the uh, the curious thing about this is that we start to get to a point where you realize that this is way outside of the realm of criminal justice. You know, it goes towards psychology. It goes towards uh, sociology, which are, you know, two of the main parts of the criminal justice field, um, especially the field of study. So I'm sure that if you haven't already, you will be taking psychology. You will be taking sociology. And if it's anything like the psychology and sociology that I took, they're kind of boring. But I can't tell you enough how eye-opening it is when you hit your jobs, when you guys get your jobs in the field, um, some of you I know out there already have your job, the, the teachings of things, especially like sociology, you start to see it at work and go, wow, it makes sense. It's very usable, I guess, or, or practical. Um, the information that they're teaching you, I guess you can get a good teacher, a bad teacher, or whatever, it can be boring, but, the idea is those are things that you want to learn if you can, because you will see these things again. And as we start to delve into these environmental roots of crime, you're going to see sociological things. You're going to see, uh, you know, sociological factors, psychological factors, mental illness, uh, things like that. So let's go ahead and dive right in here because we are going to kind of brush through this again. You need to read this. You need to understand this. My teaching here is kind of to augment your understanding. It's to clear up some of the things that can be confusing, and it's to make sure that you get a little bit of a background on it to couple with your reading. But I'm not going to just sit here and read the chapters for you because I think we both fall asleep. So um, if I breeze past something a little too quickly, by all means, shoot me an email, shoot me a message. But uh, yeah, this is just going to be something to catch you up here now. Obviously, our chapter outline is pretty good. Community and situational factors, right? Family, friends, schools. These would be sociological stuff right here. Um, even family to an extent. But, this, yeah, the family structure would be sociological. Um, and, obviously, socio-demographic correlates of crime. So, again, sociological. Um, let's go right to uh, table 4.1 because this is a great breakdown here. So category of factors and the specific risk factors for crime and antisocial behavior. This is table 4.1. It'll be on page 59 of your books. If you have the physical textbook, if you don't, just click on the table 4.1 link on the uh, digital copy here, and you'll be able to zip right to this. But it groups them together really nicely, and it's something important for you to think about. So we have community factors, right? High unemployment, high poverty level. Weak institutional resources, low collective efficacy, high levels of stress. These are things, if you grow up in a neighborhood where gunshots are zinging past your head every night, you're getting woken up in the middle of the night, you can't sleep through the night. These things have a, these things have an effect, okay? It's a sociological effect. Your society, or at least your little slice of heaven there, is uh, 
is making it difficult for you to uh, to kind of stand a straight and narrow to achieve. And um, with high poverty levels, high unemployment rates, you're going to see that people resort often to selling drugs or stealing or hustling or doing something that uh, is going to potentially land them in the system, whether that's in prison, jail, or somewhere in between. Um, that's where you get you know these high levels of unemployment, these high poverty levels. There's a high level of crime. There's nothing to do. There's you know if there's a high poverty level, they probably don't have a beautiful park to play at. Um, so they play at the abandoned building. And what goes on in the abandoned building? Nobody knows uh, except the people inside. So again, these are this is more of like a a way to think about these things. Let this guide your thought process as you go through. Um, situational, lack of adequate street lighting, adequate street lighting, warmer weather, high residential density. That's a big one right there as far as some of the causations of crime. Um, when people live really close to each other or in like maybe a big housing development or, or excuse me, a housing project even, just one big building with a bunch of people, uh, there tends to be a higher rate of crime. So apartment buildings, uh, project buildings, things like that. Um, those are things that you want to, as a police officer, maybe pay a little more attention over there because that population density, the people that are really kind of living, you know, right on top of each other. Uh, those are things that would suggest I need a presence here. And it doesn't have to be a negative presence. It can be a positive presence. I'm going to go shoot hoops with these kids or throw the football around. It's uh, it's more about being there because that's where you're going to need to be. You can get called to the to the nicer areas of town, but these apartment complexes probably need to see you, and it'll make a bigger difference. Um, so again, when we talk about places, that's one thing I wanted to mention to you guys. A lot of your feedback on the discussion posts for week one, um, it's not simply a place. It's not simply a person who commits a crime. Um, and when I'm talking, referring to the crime triangle. It is a motivated offender. And what you're looking at is what are his or her motivations, right? Is it money because they can't feed their kids? Is it money because they want to feed a drug addiction? What is the motivation? Because you can go after the drug problem. You can even help out with the unemployment problem by, you know, going and getting job applications and handing them out. But that's that would be an example of you attacking the motivation of the offender. Technically, you could lock the offender up and say, we're going to get rid of the offender, but it doesn't get rid of the motivation. It doesn't get rid of the fact that you still have a drug problem. You can lock up a drug user, but you still have a drug problem. And uh, it's the same thing with the situational lack of adequate street lighting. OK, you can get street lights up there, but you're still going to have some things that go on in like the warmer weather, the high density. And those are things that you really can't change. You can't change summer. So you may want to look at the other two. Uh, components of the crime triangle, especially for the specific crime type that you're dealing with. Um, families, one parent households, that's something that's suggestive. It doesn't mean that everybody that has a one parent household is going to commit crime, but early motherhood, um, multiple transitions, you know, you're, you're moving every two weeks to a different house. Um, parental substance abuse, yeah, if, if mom and dad are alcoholics or, or drug addicts. That's going to make things a little bit tougher and it's going to it's going to lead to a uh, it's a specific risk factor for crime and antisocial behavior, as that says. So, look, I'm not going to go through all of these. Check them out, though. Check them out. This is a really good table that pretty much lays it out. Um, so it'll answer most of your questions. OK, here we have the definitions of community and situational factors. You want to go over those. As we get a little deeper into the community factors, you see something here called social disorganization. I know what you're thinking. Awesome 90s band, right? But that's not what we're talking about with social disorganization. Um, we are talking about the, an actual crime theory. Uh, this is the social disorganization is, is like a major crime theory that you'll hear a lot about. Uh, and it really has to do with really all, addressing all of the community factors. You're kind of going all in on the community here saying, listen, these people are living on top of each other. It's a 
poor, you know, uh, indigent area. Uh, nobody's got any jobs. There are no jobs available. It's rife with uh, drug and and violence. Uh, these guys right here, Sean McKay, 1942. They're like the the founders or the guys that that uh, blasted this out he, a century ago. Social scientist Sean McKay were the ones that brought this up. It's a deep, uh, it's a deep theory. You know, it really is quite interesting, um, and it's it's pretty much all involved with this. So read this section. This is good to know. You will see social disorganization again. You will hear about Shaw and McKay again sometime in your in your academic future here. Okay, so these are things that you should know and you should. Spend a little time on, get familiar with them, and understand them. Um, great stuff here. Great stuff. I'm excited because I know where this is going. And eventually, you guys are going to be putting some of these things to work here and making some calls at the end of, uh, at the end of our semester to really, really flex your, your mental muscle here and your understanding of this stuff. Um, they're giving a lot of examples here. Community disadvantage. These are... These are the things that we talk about, you know, in politics today, when we talk about how to help people, how to make money go further, um, parents in disadvantaged neighborhoods. I mean, there's stressful conditions. There's there's so many things that you or somebody can address to have a, an impact on crime. But again, <clears throat> I'm not going to go over each and every one of them in particular. This is for you to read because you might want to read it two or three times so that you get that understanding. Situational factors. Here is another super duper major uh, crime theory. The routine activities theory. Now this routine activity theories, the routine activities theory is an important one when we talk about crime prevention because it suggests, well, let's let's just read right here. The routine activities theory, oh boy. The view that crime and victimization are more likely when motivated offenders, attractive targets, and an absence of guardianship occur simultaneously. I hope that a bunch of bells and whistles are ringing right now when you read these three things, because that, ladies and gentlemen, is our crime triangle. So, Theory developed by Lawrence Cohen and uh, Marcus Felsen. This Cohen guy, he's a sharp cookie. You'll wanna, you'll wanna, you know, put put that name in your uh, memory banks there. Um, but yeah, the routine activities theory is really what we base the crime triangle off of. Um, and again, when these three things come together, motivated offender, not just an offender, guys and girls, but a motivated offender. Okay. There's a reason that he or she is committing this crime. Lack of a capable guardian. Well, that's your that's your uh, location. But what that means is at that location, there is a good opportunity to get away with it or a better opportunity to get away with the crime than there would be at another location. So it's not just a location. It's the reason why bad guy or bad girl chose this location lack of street lights there's no cameras there's no security guards things like that um and then suitable targets target can be a piece of jewelry that was laying out on somebody's dashboard or the target can be a an old lady walking home after church with a purse um you know down a dark alley so again suitable targets not just any target right? It's the suitable target. What makes it suitable? Well, this is an old lady or a little kid that would have a hard time fighting back or fighting off someone who wished to uh, mug them. So think about that. Think about that. That's big time important stuff. I think I just screwed this up. Uh, come on now. So I zipped us all the way to the back of the book here. We'll get right back on it though. Um, so yeah, you guys are really getting into the stuff here that will create an understanding for you on how to prevent crime. These are the deep, deep, deep thoughts that go into um, how to truly address crime rates rather than just individual crimes. So 
pretty good stuff here. Uh, routine activity theories, that's what RAT is. <clears throat> but again, um, people, it, it basically, you're going to have to read this again. But the routine activity theories is, addresses each one of those three crime triangle uh, components on a, on a deeper level. You're going to understand why a suitable target is suitable. You're going to understand why a motivated offender is motivated, and you're going to understand why uh, a uh, lack of guardianship makes for an appealing location to commit crime. So we get into alcohol and illegal drugs. <clears throat> Alcohol and illegal drugs are important with regards to crime because of how many crimes they, they basically fill our jails and our prisons. Okay, um, here it is right here. Many prison and jail inmates report being under the influence of alcohol and our drugs at the time they committed the crime that leads to their arrest and subsequent incar incarceration. So basically, Many prison jail and jail inmates say I was drunk or I was high when I did whatever I did to get in to land my butt in jail. Um, these are things to think about, because if that's true, if that's true, that they were high and drunk and or drunk uh, when they committed the crimes that landed them in, in the in the hokey, then we should be going after alcohol and illegal drugs. We should be making it a point to go after these things if that, and, and hint, hint, it does uh, lead to a higher propensity to commit crimes. If you guys look down here, we cannot necessarily infer an illegal, oh, come on now. We cannot necessarily infer uh, an illegal drug use, criminal behavior, causal sequence from correlation between illegal drug use and criminality. So there's a correlation, okay, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a causation. So think about those things. Um, where drugs are, crime tends to be, but it doesn't necessarily <clears throat> mean that drugs cause crime. Although we're going to get into some stuff later here that uh, suggests they have a, they play a critical role. Um, and here they're going to talk a little bit deeper about that. Criminologists have sought to de determine the exact role that illegal drugs plays in criminal behavior. That's an important one. Um, research is being done every day. Every time you see these things here, this 2001, 2013, those are articles or research papers that somebody probably spent months on to, to make a point so that now we can say, hey, drugs cause this, or hey, Drugs have nothing to do with that. So <clears throat> these are things that when you see stuff like that, you'll know that people are referring to academic works, not just a, a CNN or a Fox News story, okay? This is something that somebody has gone out and measured. So again, drugs and alcohol um, are going to be present often at crime. Whether or not they actually cause crime, that's something that you'll have to think about and make a determination on your own. Um, however, it's it's an interesting thought because it's not always what you think. Uh, handguns and other firearms. Here's another one. We talk about banning firearms and, and the Second Amendment, and boy, what a what a back and forth we get in uh, you know at the dinner table sometimes. When we're at that family cookout over Fourth of July, right? Uh, we start to think about things, and you know, Uncle So and So is a Second Amendment guy. You'll never take my guns from me because blah blah blah. And Uncle So and So is, you know, a, a gun control advocate. Uh, he wants stricter gun laws, and 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 the two of them will argue until the day comes, but. Here's some actual factual information. Uh, read this section. Now, there's 300 million firearms, okay, in the in just in America, just in the United States. So gun buybacks or stop sell, you know, to stop selling guns right now would 
would be difficult to really have an impact for quite a long time because guns don't exactly, you know, they don't exactly go bad or expire, <clears throat> um, especially if you take care of them. Let's see here. So they're going to get into the National Crime Victimization Survey. That's an important one um, because it, it suggests um, how many uh, victims report using a gun or threatening or actually shooting a perpetrator. So how many times did people defend themselves with these guns that are, that are so close to the Second Amendment uh, arguments? Well, here's some research for you to check out in a pretty short package to, to go over this and learn a little something about Learn a little something that's not necessarily uh, trying to influence you one way or another. These are facts because these are actual studies. Now, does that mean every study that you read is, uh, is true or is taken at face value? No. I can tell you right now, there are a lot of studies that are, that are crappy studies. But the good ones are invaluable. And uh, <clears throat> when I say good or crappy, it really has to do with how they measure things or whether or not they measure things, not whether or not it fits my narrative or my opinions. So, again, my opinions are formed or are shaped by some of these studies that you guys are reading now, some of these things that you're that you're delving into. So just keep that in mind. Now, family, friends and schools, these are more sociological factors. Um, the family structure, single parent households, um, abusive uh, households, uh, lack of food, lack of care, you know, neglect, child, child neglect, improper nutrition or malnutrition. All of these things are some of the stuff that you're going to be uh, reading about. And all of these things have an effect. Here we start to get into that nature versus nurture. If you've ever heard that that uh, argument posed, what people are saying when they say that is, you know, are criminals born criminals or are they made into criminals? You know, are they shaped by some rough life experiences or were they just born without compassion? You know, some people just, just have it to where they don't care. And uh, I, you know, we, this is still something that's out there to be answered. But what we're talking about now with with the family structure, like social factors, we're talking about nurture, not nature, meaning these are the things that will shape people to commit crimes. So, you know, the family structure, uh, again, these are not uh, not my words, but it's it's actually research here that says, uh, <clears throat> you know, single parent households are tend to be. Uh, indicative of, of crime or, or, or create a higher propensity. Family functioning, family interaction, so sitting down, eating dinner every night, things like that you wouldn't think really correlate to uh, success or to crime, but they do. I don't know why. I don't know if it's causation, but it's certainly correlation. So again, these are, you know, they're talking about the family structure here. You know, are you, uh, are you DJ Tanner at Full House? Uh, hopefully some of you guys know that. But, uh, yeah, here it is, family structure. Do you have, you know, a parent that can sit you down and tell you, you know, all the things you did, good or bad, and give you big hugs? Or do you have a parent that hugs you with their fist at night? And, uh, you know, those are the things that uh, researchers have identified as being crime causation uh, or, or factors. <clears throat> so children in single parent households may behave worse, not because of their number of parents per se, but because single parent households are typically low income households. Ah, so what do we have here? We have the same thing as our ice cream and murder argument, right? Ice cream sales are typically indicative of murder rates, higher ice cream sales, more murders. But it's not necessarily because murderers eat ice cream all the time. It's because ice cream sales are higher in the summertime and murders are higher in the summertime. Here we have the same idea. 
not necessarily a single parent household. It doesn't just because you have one parent doesn't mean that you're gonna, you know, necessarily fall victim to that. But what they find is that single parent households are typically low income households, and that that economic distress is something that can be uh, a predictor of crime of criminality, or at least open the door. <clears throat> So you're going to go through a lot of interesting ideas here that uh, that suggest crime causation or, or crime correlation, excuse me. Um, family functioning and parenting. I mean, these are all the family interactions. And it's important to ooh, the social bonding theory. It's important to uh, it's important for you guys to at least read these once. Read this chap. This, these are not long chapters. I purposely picked this book because these are not long chapters, but they're definitely quality over quantity. So they're not beating you over the head with 10 or 30 pages per chapter. However, the, the few pages that you do have are really all good. Um, <clears throat> so social bonding theory, super important theory. Self-control theory, another one, super important talks about the impulsiveness of children, okay? Um, man, yeah. These are, these are the building blocks of the criminal justice field. Whenever you see the word theory by something, you should read that twice because you're going to see it again. And if you start throwing out social bonding theory and self-control uh, self theory in some of your other classes or on some of your other papers, Man, I bet you your professors are going to do backflips, and uh, hopefully you get high grades for it. So again, self-control theory has to do mainly with um, adolescents or or even children, children, you know, young children. Adolescence is usually, you know, uh, whatever, 12 to 15, 16. Um, and then when we say children, we, we start talking about maybe below 12, so, you know, 11 and, and younger. Um but he said that uh, individuals with low self-control are more likely to be impulsive, to violate social norms, and to misbehave during childhood and commit delinquency during adolescence. So low self-control is a, a predictor, right? It's the self-control theory. You're going to hear more and more and more about that, so get to know it. Uh, parental discipline and supervision of children. So yeah, here's here's another one. If you spank your kids, is that gonna see spare the rod, spoil the child? Frequent spanking and other harsh discipline do produce more misbehavior. What? That says Mackenzie and buddies. That's what et al means and group. Um, Mackenzie et al. 2015 said that frequent spankings and other harsh discipline do produce more misbehavior. If you want to read that article because you think that's interesting or you think that that's crazy talk, look it up at the end of the chapter. Look up McKenzie and then look up 2015 and you'll be able to potentially look up that article on Google or wherever or in your Bowling Green library and see exactly what do you consider misbehavior, McKenzie, right? So these are how you consume this, this research. Anyway, let's breeze through this again. Parental substance abuse. Yeah, big shocker. If uh, mom and dad are slamming H, then you might be prone to crime uh, as you get older. These are, these are not exactly groundbreaking, uh, groundbreaking discoveries, but it's important because if Lander, Houseware, and Byrne didn't actually do the research, we wouldn't be able to say that with validity. Okay. Peer influences. Here's an idea. Do you think that if uh, your friends are all doing something, you might have a likelihood of doing something? Probably. I'm sure you guys heard the saying, well, if your friend jumped off a bridge, does that mean you will? Well, the social learning explanations would suggest that, yeah, you would. Uh, I've seen some crazy fashion trends in my time. And uh, now that I'm older, I look at some of these young people, teenagers, 
And I shake my head, but you know what? That's what everybody's wearing. That's the cool thing, right? Social learning explanations stress that adolescents are more likely to commit delinquency depending on the types of friends that they have. So guess what? If you hang out with gangbangers, you're probably going to gangbang, right? You're probably going to get out there and do some, some dirt. If you hang out with drug dealers, you're probably either going to use drugs eventually or sell them too. Um, and it doesn't mean that you always will. It just means that if, if this is who you're surrounding yourself with, then you're going to end up adopting what they consider as successful, right? And if uh, uh, you know a group of kids think that the, the the meanest, you know, most ruthless gang member is the coolest one, then that's what you're going to aspire to be, not knowing that all that really gets you is either an early grave or a prison cell. Schools and schooling they play a significant role in adolescents' lives. <clears throat> um, however, I'm not going to get too deep into this one. The social bonding theory, though is going to be an important one. Here's Cohen again. Dude sharp. Hershey's pretty good too. You're going to you're going to hear a lot about these guys. Um, let's go ahead and pass the school one though. I want to get into socio demographic correlates of crime. So, who commits crimes? So, right here is going to give you the, the little preface of what uh what you're about to read, but four fundamental socio-demographic variables predict criminality. Now to break that down, socio-demographic means, well, here's the variables. I'll just, instead of explaining it to you and confusing anybody or myself, um, age, gender, social class, race and ethnicity, okay? These right here, these correlates in turn have implications for crime prevention, okay? So if you knew that the 15 to 30 year old age range commits more than their fair share of street crime and you wanted to bring the levels of street crime down, are you gonna hang out at the old folks' homes and tell them not to slang dope? Probably not. You're gonna go to the high school you're going to go to the open gym where, you know, some 20 year olds are hanging out, maybe even, maybe even some of the clubs. Um, and you're going to do some outreach stuff there. You're going to try to educate, you know, in a way that actually reaches them. It's a challenge, but, uh, but look at that. They break it down for you. If you go after this group here, 15 to 30 year olds, you're going to be successful. Gender males, are about half the population, but account for four-fifths of violent crime. So that's 80% of the violent crime um, is done by males. Are you going to go to the women's uh, gymnastics tournament and talk about why they shouldn't join gangs and beat each other up? Hey, maybe one of them is a gang member, but this would suggest that you're going to be much more effective if you go to the open gym, if you go to the... Uh, I don't know if you go to the beach or whatever, man, wherever males are, um, you're going to be more successful at decreasing street crime if you can reach them. So not only do you have to find them, but you got to say some stuff that they care about. Social class. Yeah. Guess what? Low income, um, lower class. These are, these are things that are, uh, suggestive, uh, correlates, if you will of of crime and race and ethnicity look it is what it is um here's the thing about this though Com like so look down here compared with whites african americans are much more likely to be poor and to live in the disadvantaged neighborhoods discussed earlier in this chapter these conditions foster frustration and anger and impede good parenting skills these are this is research you know, so this is not meant to offend anybody. This is, you know, this is the book. It's not me, obviously, saying this. But the thing is, they're not saying that people commit crimes because they're white or because they're African American. They're saying that African Americans are much more likely to be poor and live in disadvantaged neighborhoods. That means, um, like, percentage or per capita. 
And then if you go back up here, if you're poor or live in a low income neighborhood, guess what? You're in the low social class. You're in the lower, uh, lower class. You have middle class, upper class, lower class. You would be in the lower class. And, uh, and that makes things tougher. It's harder to succeed. Uh, the need for multifaceted crime. Oh boy, here we get into the good stuff. General strain theory. Agnew, okay? This guy, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, definitely learn the general strain theory. Uh, this is, I'm not going to get too deep into this because, again, this is like a sociology class. Um, this would probably be a whole dang chapter. I'm not going to do it justice certainly not in this couple of minutes but read this and know about this it basically says that you hate your living environment you want to be successful but it causes stress because you're stuck here and that is what that's that feeling that stress that strain is what causes crime um so again uh like when when teenagers beat someone up and steal their wallet it's not really because they want the money. It's because they want to beat someone up because they're unhappy that they're that they don't have money. Um, and that's kind of what the general strain theory suggests. Again, I'm not doing it full justice because we'd be here for hours. But read this, get familiar with this. This is a big one. Um, life course criminology conclusion. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and back up to chapter five we're going to breeze through this one a little quicker um poverty and crime employment and crime reducing poverty and promoting stable employment here's what we're going to do to kind of make this uh go a little smoother we just talked about how lower class uh you know lower income areas can be suggestive or, or correlate to crime employment tends to uh tends to combat lower income right if, if you have a full-time job and especially a good one and you keep that job for a long time you're going to get a be a manager soon and uh you know you're going to have a, a decent salary to where you're not necessarily going to end up you know in that lower class and have those those kinds of uh issues to worry about but as we we're going to go all the way down uh, maternal nutrition, maternal stress and drug use. This has nothing to do with the economy. Um, let's see here. Yeah, we're going to stick to kind of the financial stuff, okay? Again, you got to read this. You have got to read these chapters to get this material. But poverty and crime... We talked about that, toxic stress. These things are going to be important. Negative peer influences, parenting and other family functioning, maternal stress and drug use. These are big ones. You could probably have guessed them, but it really goes a little bit deeper into why. Neighborhood conditions, moving to opportunity, Chicago Housing Authority. There we go. Employment and crime. That's where we want to be. So here we go. Educational attainment and annual unemployment rate. So if you have less than a high school degree, you didn't you dropped out of high school, you're probably 6.5% uh, unemployment rate. If you have a high school degree, it goes down almost 2%. Some college goes down almost another percent. If you have a bachelor's degree, you're 4% less likely to be unemployed. And if you have an advanced degree, it only goes down a half a percent. But yeah. That's 2%, 2 percent, two out of a hundred people with an advanced degree are unemployed. That's probably because they just want to be. Um, where's the racial breakdown? Uh, we can you can read that for yourselves. Uh, the potential relevance of employment status for conventional crime. Eh, it's potentially relevant, yes. But again, there are so many variables here. Um, you can say, hey, wow, you know, this, this says that, uh, 
22.3% of African Americans are unemployed. But what's the men and women breakdown, the male and female breakdown of that? Um, are 20% of those males? Or, or I'm sorry, are 80% of that 22.3 males? Um, if so, and yeah, we know who we need to be reaching out to. Are 80% of those males 30 years old? You know? So think about that age. All these things have a place of importance when we're talking about how we would take the biggest bite out of crime by doing something in particular. Reducing poverty and promoting stable employment. Yep, that's going to be one of your big goals here. However, how do you do it? Well, look at that. It gave you this nice little uh, list here. But you'll see that some of these are doable, some of these are not. Raising the minimum wage. You know, that's that's something that they talk about all the time. Um, but that's going to have an impact on something else. And yeah, it's a it's a deep conversation to have. But the point is, you want to do that so that it has the appropriate effect. You don't want to raise minimum wage, get all the negatives, and it doesn't have an effect on crime. So we have to kind of make sure that we're measuring twice and cutting once because once you raise minimum wage to 12 bucks an hour, it's not coming back down. Um, even if you're like, wow, it had no effect on crime. So read this chapter, go over the, the details. Uh, it's really quite fascinating. The stuff here, again, not super long, um, but the information here is all useful information. I'm just not going too deep into it because half of you are probably already tuning out. Um, and those who aren't, I think you have a really good, solid um, understanding of, of what I need you to know. And honestly, what these chapters have to offer. Um, if there's any confusion or if there's something that you're, you're not quite sure about and it's not addressed in this video and it's not addressed in the uh, readings, reach out to me. I have no problem. I'm always online uh, Wednesday nights, so you know I'll log on again. I haven't had too many uh, takers on that, which that's A-OK. -okay. You guys are doing well. You don't have to. That's really just for me to say, hey, I'm here. I'm available. It's kind of like office hours. Um, since I don't have an office, and this class isn't in person. It's just me being available so that if you want to shoot by the office or log on to the Zoom, you can. But if not, party on. So that's going to end our quick week three lecture here, I guess, if you want to call it that. Um, and with that being said, make sure that you knock out quiz number two and discussion post number two because those are going to be two very, very important things with regards to your grades because this week we have a, a double and uh, the quizzes are going to be something that you're going to see again. You're going to see these questions again eventually. So um, know the information. That's all I have to say. Your discussion posts are going to ask you to explain something. Demonstrate your understanding of it. <coughs> oh, pardon me. Demonstrate your understanding of the subjects and uh, and show me that you get it. Also, when you respond to a classmate, please make it more than just, hey, great post, I agree. It's got to be got to be something a little more. Add to their post. You know what I mean? Either build on it, disagree with them respectfully, um, but do something that is of value. Um, your work reflects you. I don't, most of you I won't get a chance to meet, but uh, but there's still an impression that gets created in my head when I read your assignments. That's all I know of you. So make sure you're, you're giving your best effort there on these assignments because uh, you never know who you'll need, uh, you know, a letter of recommendation from or something like that. So anyway, be safe. If you need anything, text or email. And I will see you guys next week.